Hello, welcome to Law Master's Land. I am your Law Master, here today for our second half of the history of one nation which is two separate nations. This week, the independent, but forever at war, no Mathis. Let's jump right in, shall we? So, review from last week. Shanaxian vessel state of Malthun broke free, but the north and the south of Vassius agreed. Being to the north through sabotage, supplies they sent to the south. Continuing on with history, Malthun marched to try to put down the rebellious north and their Fangwood Rebellion. They met at the city of Tamran in the battle known as the First Offensive, with the more powerful and better trained south coming out on top. However, this only lasted three months. Then the north recaptured the city, with their first move being to tear down the city walls. One would think this would work against them, but it actually worked wonders, because each time Morthun would march onto the city, the inhabitants would fade into the forest, then continue to strike the defenseless town until the army had no choice but to retreat. So skirmishes became the leading northern strategy, with the greatest of them being Eagle Nilmoth and his band, Eagle's Axe. However, eventually the South's patience wore thin, leading them to chain, change the plan and charge past Tamran and try to take as much land as possible, chopping down all forests in their way, which was a big mistake, because that pushed the local druids firmly into the rebels' camp, and the Battle of Bloody Teeth ended with Morthun pushed back, then out of Tamran. Malthun surrendered, and the north was no peace, with Eagle and Nimoth himself set to draw new borders. However, just as ink was about to touch paper, an unknown assassin killed Eagle. The north wept, and the south conveniently took back their surrender. That is how the standstill has been. The north, now named Nimothus after their greatest warrior, Claims independence, but Marthun continues to claim they never let the North go. The battles have gone off and on over the years, alternating between cold and hot. The recently new bloodshed has led the current generation to turn red hot. Because of being ruled by Cheliax and then Marthun, Nemathus is kind of leery of a large central government. Therefore, the land is made up of thousands of true democracies, where every person makes their own decision, and everyone has a say in what affects them. There is no criminal justice system, and any laws are local, and can vary from one hilltop to another. They do bite the bullet when it comes to the war, but all who serve are volunteers. On the other hand, the attitude of everyone taking care of themselves has led to almost everyone joining the fight for some time, making the military prowess of the average citizen quite impressive, actually. There are several famous bands of citizens doing their own things, including the Chesano Rangers of the Chesano region, the Foxclaws who raided Malthoon, and the Eagle's Axe, the inheritors of the original band who are the greatest of guerrilla fighters. The actual leadership is determined by representatives of, well, every possible way you can break down the country, electing a central military leader, this leader called the first marshal, every four years. The current marshal is Reslin Galbraith, though again, his authority ends at the front lines. When it comes to civil matters, each citizen refused to give up their ability to give their own opinion. I think it is apparent at this point, but the citizens of Nemathis value being free above anything else. Every decision, every act is weighed against how much freedom, if any, they would need to give up. To do this, they have worked to be self-sufficient. No one needs to rely on others for anything. And the sign of being an adult is to keep your problems bottled up until they are so bad you do need someone else. <laughs> Again, both sides have their own problems, even if Nomathis is more my speed. 
and the path to be where they can always stand alone. They learn to build houses, treat wounds, gather and grow food, make their own clothes, keep supplies safe, and so on and so on. Another negative is that this sometimes leads them to acting with arrogance towards those who need to rely on others for anything. In terms of tactics, the Marthas can be summed up in two words. Keep moving. They will not stay in one spot and suffer massive casualties for buildings they can rebuild, crops they can replant. They're not going to let their enemies keep their lands either, but wear them down by melting into the forest, coordinating assaults from all ends to reduce numbers, and wear down the supplies and morale as the preferred method. Heck, they often burn their own lands down so that their enemies arrive to find nothing to give them any reason to stay, or which they can use against the natives of the land. Likewise, while Malthun prefers melee, Nemathus is a land of master archers, working to pick off the enemy before they even get close enough to be a danger. And finally, they have the home field advantage with the people's support. So there is never anyone too far off to give warriors a place to find safety, food, and considering how good all the Marthians are with their hands, supplies. Now we are at the locations part of the video. As one would expect, there was no official divisions on the map. So let's do a bit at a time like we did with Nadal. Let's start with the border with Morthun. The parts of the Marth is bordered by the Deep Cut River and the Merida River. Well, all of them except one place. Tamran is actually on the northern bank of the Meredith instead of the southern. And it is the most front line there is. Captured five times, retaken five times, and technically considered the capital of the Marthas, though we know how the Marthas work, so that does not mean anything. The city is mostly ramshackle, it being built for the purpose of being abandoned easily if Morthun attacks again. Other towns in this area include Green Glade, a main trade route which holds a monthly black market, mostly of goods raided from Morthun, Akon's Rest, home of druids who make it the duty to repair the damages done by the wars, and Put, a small village which grows cabbage and is too close to Morthun Buddha to have survived out a magical druid thrown wall. This is also home to the farthest south of the Marthian strongholds. The Fang would keep. Finally, it is the location of Undead. Because of the endless war between the two sides, many bodies have piled up, leading to places where the dead have trouble sleeping. One example of this is Dead Eyes Gulch, a small canyon filled with corpses which slowly rise, led by a druidic grave knight. Which brings us to our first side tangent, the part of the show where I would not just let a topic stay dead. Today, we have ourselves Grave Knights. Grave Knights are considered the martial equivalent of liches, though it is very rare one becomes one on purpose. True, we have a ritual that allows one to do so, but usually they instead were just cruel generals who murdered and slaughtered until they finally met their end but kept fighting anyway. Many view the transformation as a curse, as it stops them from experiencing any of the joys of their previous life, but they still try to live off of the slaughter regardless. Some abilities they have is that they get energy, energy powers based on the way they died, whether it's fire from fire, electricity from electricity, so on and so forth. They had the skills of generals, which now allowed them to command armies of undead officially. And they have unholy auras, which lessen the power of the divine around them. But the most important ability, and the most important thing to remember in general about Grave Knights, is their armor. Their armor is their true form. You can destroy the body as many times as you want, but as long as the armor continues to exist, 
they couldn't pull him and keep coming back. Once, since Game Knights are rarer than some more common revenge-driven undead, most people do not realize when it is the Grave Knight they are up against, and that they need to destroy the armor to finish it off, until it is too late. Or worse, someone loots the armor and wears it, allowing the Grave Knight to reform around them. Not pretty. Next, let's take a look at the region known as the Nesmorian Plains. This is the southwestern region known for being a prime target for invading Marthunians, and as home to our monsters. This has led to the area being, well rich and full of farmland, generally underpopulated, or at least by humans. Because here is the location of one of the Dwarven Sky Citadels, Kragadam. This region also is home to another smaller Dwarven stronghold, Glimmerhold home of evil dwarves who would get along more swimmingly with Morthun over near Marthus and their experiments in democracy. <laughs> the town of Greybanks is an example of a human settlement in this region, or at least what is left of them. A ghost town, the one which seems to be mysteriously well maintained. However, some cities still live, the largest being Pendar a 400-something population town of some of the most famed past people who supply decorations to most of Martian homes. Going farther north, we enter the Minespin Mountains, one of the last nations we have to board them until I find a way to get in last wall slash grave lands. This is also mostly Dwarven territory. You know, being the mining city of Skelt and the abandoned city of Holendron, a town not devastated by the war but by its local wizard turned undead. Again, topical. Though the greatest location of danger is instead Bloodsworn Vale, a border road between the Marthus and the Varician, where this was when this was still Chelaxian territory. There was a large war between them and the local Shanti, leading to massive deaths and cursed lands. That being said, most undead here are actually fey instead of humanoids. To the south of this pass is the Glowing Scald, one of few active volcanoes in Nomathis, and definitely the largest. It is also here that the impenetrable dragon's lair, known as Lost Mine, resides. A rare dragon took over these dwarven mines, then used the wish to a djinn to protect the lands against intruders, at the cost of actually making the hostage miners immortal until his lair is fully constructed. Which brings us to our second side tangent. Continuing parallels from last week, we have dragons. This time chromatic, which means now I only need to find an excuse to look at imperial dragons. A Tian Chi video in the future, maybe? Either way, today's video we have the original five everyone knows. So let's go through this. First off, we have black dragons. They are the most cruel and sadistic of the chromatics, ensuring all around them live in pain and fear. They prefer to live in swamps and have a general attraction to all things which rot. They can also cross bogs and quicksands without issue, and putrefy water around them to expand their homes. And breathe underwater, that kind of helps. Their breath weapon is acid, and they can use it to spread pools of acid. And let's not forget the poor dental hygiene, which allows their bite to also be acid. Finally, they have a kinship with reptiles, and can talk to and control them. Second, blue dragons. These are the schemers, the manipulators, the ones who, who position lesser races so that they get what they want. They prefer deserts, but are known to have ponds built cities over their lairs. As per their preferences, they have the power to reduce water and to kick up sandstorms. They breathe electricity, 
and we can also turn that into a thunderstorm. Also, metallic dragons aren't the only ones who have auras, and these dragons have an electric one. They are also known for being masters of illusion, being able to create mirages and imitate sounds to fool the prey. Third on the list, we have green dragons. Green dragons are scholars, which in turn leads them to being the dragons most likely to try good, though this is still uncommon. They prefer dense forests to hoard their knowledge. This is helped by their abilities to stride on impeded and to call trees to fight for them. Their breath weapon in 1E was also acid, but in 2E is the rare poison breath. And they can also create a cloud of miasma which causes them which causes those in certain areas to slowly die. They are also masters of stealth able to cover their tracks and to blend in with, well, any terrain actually, but force is the preferred, of course. Fourth at the bottom of the list, we have white dragons. These are the least smart and most thuggish of the 10 most common true dragons, but still tend to be smaller than humans. They love the cold, especially the mountains and tundras. Their abilities to see through fog and walk on ice help in that regard. Their breath, unsurprisingly, is ice, and can also be used to cause a blizzard. They have a variety of medical attacks, like causing a freezing fog, exuding a aura of cold, shaping ice, and imprisoning their targets in an icy tomb. And finally, the standard by which all other set against all other dragons are set against. The red dragon. These dragons are fierce and haughty, being the stereotypes all others are compared to. They prefer mountains, especially those volcanically active, to make their layers. This is helped by their ability to see through smoke. They, to no one's surprise, breathe fire, and it is hard enough to incinerate anyone it kills. They can also melt rocks and manipulate flames around them, and they exude an aura of fire. Now back to the main topic to finish it off. So next we got we move to the big one, the Fangwood, which takes up one third of the nation's territory. But most who live in the moth is considered synonymous with the country. It provides shelter, it provides supplies, it provides shadows for rebels to hide. The forest itself is known for creatures like trents and rail bears. But before we go into the woods, let us take a quick look at places which hang on the outside. First, there are rugged hills to the rest called the Hollow Hills, which separate the Thang Woods from the Mines Bay, home to mining, bandits, and monsters. To the north, we have Kessin, which is a small but notable lumber village. And to the east, we have Crowstump which is a village created as a stop over for those who are heading north, either to the near last wall or the far Mendev. This has made this border town a center of both trade and learning. Now moving into the forest, the first stop would be one of the most important regions, Chernasado. Chernasado has no border, but is famed for being home to the Chernasada Rangers, the skilled hunters and survivalists who call this region not only home, but call every tree an animal friend. This is also home to four forts controlled by the rangers. The crusader built Fort Osman, which is also said to have been a place where Yomide herself once resided. The ancient border fort, uh, ah, the ancient border fort Wiston, the the, inhisp the inhospitable storehouse of Fort Hondor, and the fortress in the center of a gorge on a stone pillar, Fort Tribole. As for other notable places within, we have Crossfen, a swamp village full of farm animals, but also will wisps. We have Crystalhurst, which is the secret druidic enclave of the area. And we also have the Spiral Bones, 
a sinkhole which has become the center of many ghost stories. But it's actually just an abandoned jewel city. Which is also, but the forest is also home to our third side tangent, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is the local leader of the Fae of the Fangwood. In fact, she claims to have planted the first trees of the Fangwoods when she left the First World. She formed treaties with the dwarves and the Kellens of the area, but eventually fell back from joining hands with outsiders after a failed attempt to kill the tree raiser. And she had completely ignored the human's pleas when the Whispering Tyrant took the North Fangwoods in what became known eventually as Last Wall and what is now known as Gravelands. She was for a time sealed away by one of her handmaidens and groups of blighted fae, but during the incident known as the Iron Fang invasion, had humans go deep into the Fangwoods to free her. While she's still weakened, she has enough mythic levels to qualify as a god. Though last supported had her ability to give spells limited to 7th level. Though it is quite an interesting addition you can consider adding to your tables, is she not? And now this leads us on to our final side tangent. The part of the show which is no longer about Namathus. But what used to be Namathus. See, as I've been going through the, re the areas of Namathus today, I've been going through what Namathus used to be. Less than a decade ago, in both real time and in lore, a nano nation was built from parts of Namathus, which I would be remiss to mention, but we do not have as much on this third nation as to give its own video. So, instead, it's going to be a side tangent. So, let me tell you the story that began with a hobgoblin survivor of the Goblin Blood Wars of Isgore which is a topic I need to cover one day whenever we get to Isga. The survivor named was Azersi. This event caused her to dream of an independent nation for her kind. So she built up an army to serve as mercenaries in Morthun. Then when the opportunity arose, she went rogue using the combination of various monsters' alliances and the onyx key they stole from the local dwarves to begin conquest of the, middle of the two regions I talked about in the middle, the plains and the mountains. Which, ironically, they carefully avoided Kragadon and left it independent as though they were taking mostly dwarven lands. They conquered much land until a group of adventurers bested the legion. However, instead of slaying the Hard Goblin, they offered her peace, and the right to keep the lands her army has taken had taken for the creation of a people's new home. And so Amathus kept the Fangwood and some other lands as theirs, which is the actual lands they cared about. And also, Arthrock was born. Arthrock is on the border of Nemathus and it all, but that is just a part of their kingdom. There are five entrances to the famed stone roads in Arthrock, and the nation controls actually more land in the plane of earth than it does in the material plane, making the nation not too dissimilar from an iceberg. Various creatures considered monsters live within the nation's borders, including bugbears, kobolds, and nagas. While a long time ago the nations are currently unknown, Azorsi has been making overtures to the Tianxi hobgoblin nations of Kaoling and Rocklo, even finding ways to reach them through the stone roads. But for now that's all we have on them, until the time the future brings us more. And that is it for today's video. Not only did we get some undead action in the last few weeks to celebrate the Book of the Dead, but I also got an excuse to get some dragons off my list. Either way, 
Next week, we are going with another interesting nation. But also begin a little month-long project of my own. Which is something I seem to say every month. But this one is a little more personal. So while I hope you enjoy the newly releases of books, don't let it stop you from coming back next week.